said to give me 30 seconds. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get the facilities committee meeting started. Um, it is 347. Um, myself, Amanda Grant in attendance. We have President Rodney Alexander. LT is here, and we've got some few people remotely. Um, Mary's here. Um, Nancy's here. Anyone else committee-wise here that I can't see? All right, yeah, Mr. Moody, we've got a few other people. So um, those of you who are online, if you could just check in really quick and we'll get started. James Henderson. Michael Boulder of Burning Manuel. Leonard Moody is here. Carl Chimetti, Kirks and Will. Jake Freak with the Law Engineering. Michelle McKenna, Michael Gray. Dan McDonald, Provisor Lee. Leon Hills, PMSA. Jessica Wagner at Perkins and Well. Jay, did I see Nathan pop up and then disappear? Uh, you know, I thought I saw him. I saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I saw him. Yep. Yeah, I, um, now I don't see him. Mm. Uh, let me quickly call him and I'll confirm. Oh, uh, he just emailed me. His, he's having computer issues. He's restarting and will rejoin. So uh, that'll be Nathan Kinsey with all our engineering when he does join us. Great, thank you. All right, do we have any citizens' comments? No? No citizens' comments? Uh, everyone take a look at the minutes from the last meeting. Any questions? All right, moving forward, let's go to the uh, facility master plan updates. Perkins and Will, you are up first. All right, just give me a second here and I'll share the screen and then we can get going. Okay, so uh, as I said uh, at, the, uh, at our last meeting, um, I'm going to steal a little bit of the thunder of uh, Gilbane here this evening. Uh, we have just an update that's just to view, uh, there's a few days old now, uh, the, what the, the stadium out there looks like. And if you see it recently, you'll see that the visitor bleachers have been almost fully constructed and the ongoing work at the uh, stadium continues. But uh, great progress being made out there today. Um, what we have today is an update on the design schedule for sequence three, and an update on, uh, just wanted to highlight uh, the financial uh, performance uh, of the project to date to uh, reinforce uh, the efforts that have been uh, made to date. Uh, a request uh, from our last meeting with the board was an update on the HVAC energy efficiency summary uh, for the last uh, sequence of work. And then a uh, review of the West uh, Sunshade mock-up, if you remember we talked about this a while back as well, and then we'll hand it over to Bill Payne. As far as the design schedule is concerned, we're here at the end of summer break, and so we're at the point where we're kicking off our sequence three design. We've had a number of conversations to view where we sat on the overall budget, as well as where we sat on uh, any priority projects um, that we were discussing uh, to date. And we've had a few alternates that have been added to the project that I think we'll talk about here also. Um, and as part of our discussions and seeing where we sit financially overall to make sure that we're using as much of the, uh, the, the uh, funds that are available that have been made available through the savings on the previous two uh, phases of work. Um, we've also talked about prioritization of other projects uh, ongoing and uh, forthcoming uh, that will start to weave into the project also here. Any questions on the schedule overall? So uh, we wanted to, get to, again, highlight where we sit generally uh, on the budget after the, the efforts of sequence one and two. And these are you know, positive stories that we have here uh, we, because of the 
Uh, the way that the district has worked with uh, the design and construction team to uh, simplify projects, uh, to narrow down scopes, um, and to really work hard to get the projects executed um, well, as well as some fortune that, that uh, befell the district uh, from how the projects were bid out and when they were bid out. So uh, bottom line on, C on sequence one budget, um, these numbers show that the, the budget, so this is, uh, as Carl would say, the day before bids that were opened, uh, the budget numbers that have been provided by Gilbane said that we are going to come in around five, $15.9 million for the, the sequence one work. Uh, when bids were opened, we were at $15.56 million. And then at the end of the work, when all was said and done, the work actually cost the district $15.2 million. Um, so you can see that versus the budget, uh, from the final cost versus the budget was $635,000 under, and the savings versus the bid, so the final cost versus the cost that we that was anticipated to be paid on bid day is almost $300,000 for sequence one. And so those, those are funds that automatically re-rolled back into the project, and we're using them for a basis for um, looking at the overall projects avail funds available for our sequences two and three. We look at tracking of our sequence two budget performance, and this is of, as of the second of this month, because we still have work ongoing at the stadiums and we still have uh, some budget tracking for uh, potential um, credits that are coming out of the work that was done this summer as well. So the budget, again, this is as of the day before the bids were open, was around $38 million. At bids, we came in at $34.5 million, so a significant difference between the budget and the actual bid at a date. So to date, the, the final cost of the, of the work is targeting around $34 million. There have been some additional items that have been added to the scope, and these are items that are uh, scope beyond the work that was done. So uh, uh, work that um, was requested by the district to be done that was adjacent to or convenient to, or in some cases, alternates that were accepted that were just not included in the original bid amount. And that, that totals around $446,000 of additional scope work that was added after a bid. And so that the savings from the budget is around $4 million, and the savings versus the bid is around that $446,000. But you know, we're still working on, and that's negated out by the, the added scope uh, to date, but we're still working on some additional credits that we will anticipate seeing in the, uh, as we continue on through the project. So Carl, anything I do want to add here at the end? Um, so the bottom line is that we sit here at $4.6 million under budget to date and around $742,000 under bid. So even those bid amounts that you anticipated, these are the contracts that were being let at bid date, we've come in significantly under. And that's again due to the good work of Gil Bain and due to the good work of the district. Um, to come in and, and really uh, sharpen pencils and understand what the scope is here and, and really work hard uh, to, to bring the project in there as well. Um, working with the design team, working with the, with the construction managing, management team, and really the hard work of everyone involved in the project. Any additional comments, questions, concerns? Yeah, just really quick. I appreciate seeing these two numbers, but I feel like um, I'm just wondering if they're necessary. It just, because I'm just trying to head off problems now, and you know what people are going to say. They're going to be like, oh, 4.6 under budget. Does that mean that you guys didn't know what you were doing when you were putting the budgets together? Um, and I know well, that there's been a lot of criticism leveled at you guys lately, and I'm really just trying to head it off. No, and I appreciate that. Um, we wanted to, we just really wanted to highlight what we believe was a success for the project. Uh, you know, the four, the, the sequence two, the significant portion of that sequence two uh, uh, underage that we saw overall was because of the market forces uh, that were available to us. Um, we were, it is an unpredictable bidding atmosphere at the time, and it was fortunate for the district. And now, what, what I cautioned at the very beginning of that summer uh, work, because of the amount that we were under, was that we would uh, we would be seeing you know a significant 
the scrutiny of the documents and the significant scrutiny of the cost of the of the overall costs on the project and that and that because of where we sit overall under bid because those allowances that were put in were not used fully and those are prudent allowances that were added to the project due to the nature of the work the speed of the work and the and the existing conditions that we may run into you know all those allowances hadn't been fully used and so you know we've come out of the summer in a better position than than we would have anticipated and I think it's again to the credit of the of the everybody involved in the project to bring it where it is right now right I think that there's another way we can word this or show what money is going back into the project overall just remembering last month you guys were criticized for not having x-ray vision sure so I really like to make this as simple as possible for all of our sakes during the meeting next week so if we could just you know I mean keeping I'm not saying take numbers out or move numbers but I'm saying a better explanation of what we're seeing of the under budget versus the under bid and how much money exactly we've saved overall and how much money is going to be carried over to future projects okay we'll scrub it down and make sure that we are very clear on this overall but the the bottom line for this group the 4.6 million that we sit under budget right now that was again monies that we had anticipated spending before bids were open and before the work was done that's getting reallocated back into sequence three projects awesome well I think this is great I just unless you can buy a x-ray vision with it I want to be really careful about what we present sure thank you understood thanks we'll hand over a presentation on the HVAC energy efficiency now if you remember this was a question that came up at the board meeting regarding the systems that have been installed at East and West the West system is up and running I believe that they have air conditioning in the classrooms there we know that the that we had some some issues with getting the switch over on energy from ComEd electricity on ComEd and no fault of ComEd's getting the electricity switch over there and that should be powering up here soon we don't have a strict date on when that's going to be available to the school but we we hope that that's that's very soon here so I'll hand it over to Jay and Nathan thanks Mike yeah so just to kind of start off in the HVAC energy efficiency I kind of want to give an overview of the different systems that are that have been installed at the two schools you can go to the next slide please there Mike so we'll start with Proviso East this is kind of a high-level diagram just kind of showing the main components of the system and what the system is is a water-cooled variable refrigerant flow or VRF and which is essentially a very high performance heat pump system that utilizes refrigerant as the main means of heat transfer and so if you look at the top of the screen here in this diagram this kind of represents the main equipment that is at the central plant level and then as you work your way down the page towards the bottom you end up at the room level or the classrooms that we're trying to serve and this system is really responsible mainly for the space heating and cooling that's going on at these room levels the main component that's kind of at the heart of the system is in the middle of the page on the right hand side is a water-cooled VRF compressor unit and that's kind of the middle point between the central plant and what's going on at the room level so on the working our way back towards the top of the page from that compressor unit towards the central plant you're utilizing condenser water piping that's connecting all of these components and this water is circulated around utilizing pumps and essentially in cooling this unit is rejecting its heat that it's getting from the spaces and sending it back to the plant and so as you make your way up the page and back to the left you're going to the cooling tower that's your main source of heat rejection on the right hand side we have the heating portion of this now at east we have existing steam boilers we're utilizing those and we have a steam to hot water heat exchanger which then converts steam to hot water 
which then allows us to introduce hot water to this condenser water loop to maintain the loop temperature. On these compressor units, as they have compressors in them, they do have weight heat, and that does make up a portion of the heating component. However, you do need a little bit of a buffer to maintain that loop temperature, and that's what the, the boilers and that heat exchanger are being utilized to do. But then if you move the other direction, we're now not dealing with condenser water, but with refrigerant. So the compressor unit is connected to all these components from the middle of the page down via a network of refrigerant piping. So the first component is pipe two is a VRS heat recovery unit. It's essentially just a stupid box that's in the, the ceiling and it's just directing refrigerants where to go. And as you can see, it's connected to multiple units. These are indoor units that are located in various spaces. And as an example, I just have a couple classrooms, a computer lab, and an IT closet just to kind of give a sample. And you can see these rooms are in various stages of conditioning. Some are in heating, some are in cooling. And that's the flexibility of the system. You're allowed to do that simultaneously. Not everyone's coming along for the ride if you're in heating or vice versa if you're in cooling. So as we get into the colder season month, where you may have uh, all of a sudden a snap of cold weather and you're in cooling, you can switch over to heating quite quickly and back to cooling once the weather subsides. So it's got great flexibility in the system from that aspect. Um, so then from the heat recovery boxes, you pipe each one of the indoor units. Um, really you're just, uh, you know, redirecting refrigerant, whether it's, if it's in heating, you're, you're directing hot refrigerant to that space. Um, if it's in cooling, you're, you're, um, directing the cool refrigerant to, to that unit to provide cooling. Um, so that's kind of just a general overview uh, of this system. Um, before we go to the next slide, which will address the ventilation side of the system, does anybody have any questions about this? Nathan, if I could just ask one, one question. And, and from, a, from an energy transfer side, if you look at the efficiencies on you know, various systems, you have uh, some systems use just air to transfer energy, uh, some are using water, or and some are using this this coolant system, refrigerant system. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, just so just looking at the, the fluid that you utilizing to move heat around, refrigerant is the most efficient um, when compared to water and then air. Air would be the least efficient. Um, so that's why the, you know that's one reason that this system you're you're going to you know be able to capture a lot of savings and. And, and it's a very high efficiency system compared to other, uh, you know, systems that are available on the market nowadays. So this next slide is is now looking at um, the system that's providing ventilation to all these spaces, and it's called a dedicated outdoor air system, or DOAS for short, and it's a rooftop unit. And there's several of these rooftop units that are located on obviously the roof of Proviso East, and they are a ducted system. So the responsibility of these units are to bring in 100% fresh air from the outdoors and deliver it to the spaces to provide ventilation in. So you can see kind of the diagram here, um, the ventilation air in purple going to each of the spaces, but each space receives its dedicated branch duct to deliver air and supply to that space. You're not sharing air between spaces. On the opposite side, that teal color is exhaust. So we don't want to overpressurize the space. So the air that we put in, we have to also take air out of the space. So kind of look at it as taking out the stagnant air, providing fresh air. And so this is, air is then exhausted, collected in, again, a ducted system and brought back to the rooftop unit and exhausted to the outdoors. But however, before we exhaust that air to the outside, we want to make sure we capture whatever energy is available in that so we can minimize the, the, the amount of mechanical heating and cooling we have to do at that system and lower our utility costs. So there is a fixed plate heat exchanger located in the rooftop unit, which takes the waste heat from the exhaust air and either free heat outdoor air from the winter or pre-cool 
outdoor air for in the summer before being exhausted. So therefore, the amount of temperature difference that we have to either raise to heat or lower to cool is reduced, therefore reducing the amount of mechanical work we have to do with the unit, translating to savings. On the control side, we've implemented demand control ventilation. So you can see at each one of these occupied rooms, the classroom, you have a control damper on the supply and you have a CO2 sensor on the return or the exhaust. So we're monitoring the amount of CO2 in that exhaust air to determine how much ventilation to introduce to the space utilizing a control damper, which could be basically on or off, open or closed. So that way we're not underventilating or we're not overventilating a space. We're, we're providing the correct amount of ventilation and we're not wasting um, uh, electricity by overcooling or overheating. Hey Nathan, um, you know, in the era of COVID, obviously there are a lot of advantages that a uh, 100% fresh air system has. Can you maybe touch on how that differs from some other systems on, on the market and why this one is kind of unique uh, in, in that it is a DOA system? Yeah, so the traditional um, air systems are mixed air. So you would have, say, a ductwork system like this going to each of the spaces. Um, but instead of taking that exhaust air from the room and, and rejecting it, um, a percentage of it would be mixed back in with the fresh air and then resupplied to the spaces. So you're essentially taking return air from other rooms and mixing it and supplying it to other spaces essentially mixing air between all those different rooms that are on that system. Whereas this, there is no mixing between spaces. You're providing fresh air directly to that space, and the air that's removed is taken out and removed from the building. It's not mixed back in. So that's, I mean, that sounds awesome, but what, at what point, or does the system need a filter versus other systems that are already in place? Like, is any of this air being filtered? Is it being filtered before it goes back out? Yeah, so this system, there, there are two levels of filtration. So a, a traditional mixed air system, you would have filters at a central air handler or rooftop unit. So you would be filtering not only the outdoor air, but also the return air after it's mixed with it. It would be filtered and then um, resupplied to the spaces. In this case, you're, you're taking in only outdoor air. So you have filters, you have a pre-filter and a final filter that's filtering the outdoor air. Um, there are filters on the, uh, on the exhaust air stream to protect the energy recovery ventilator, but again, that air is being thrown away. So you're not, you're not filtering air that's being returned from the building because you're exhausting all of it. All you're really doing is conditioning the, and filtering the air that you're bringing into the building from the outside for dust and pollen and things like that. On the second level of filtration would be on the VRF side. So each one of the classrooms, for instance, have one or, or multiple of these VRF ducted indoor units. Each one of those have a set of filters because they are essentially supplying and returning from the same space because they're just handling the space heating and space cooling. So that air is being turned over locally, but again, it's not being mixed between other spaces. It's local to that space only. So you have filtration not only at the outdoor air unit, the, the rooftop unit that's providing your fresh air, but you also have local filtration at the VRF indoor unit. Hey Nathan, can you touch bases on the MERV 8 and 14 filters that's going to be used and why they're important for the system? Yeah, sure. So the so MERV is basically a rating for, for a level of filtration. Um, at the outdoor, at the rooftop units, uh, the, the pre-filters are MERV-8, and the final filters are MERV-14, which is a very high level of filtration. Um, it, it's, uh, I can't remember that percentage. Did you recall the percentage? It, it's like 90 plus. Um, anything beyond that, you'd be looking more for filters that would be at more of a, um, a healthcare level, like a hospital. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, education type building, um, you know, MER 14 is what we're trying to push everyone towards, uh, especially with what's been going on the you know the last last year year and a half. Yeah, Nate, um, uh, MER 14 is about 85, 86 percent. Okay. 
Yeah, just so, it. Yeah, still, so, still so, a lot better. So then at, um, at the, the room level, uh, the, the, the VRF indoor units have MERV-8. And really that's the, the, what we did was we maximized um, the level of filtration that each of these equipment are capable of providing. Because again, we're dealing with fan motors that only have the ability to push the air so much. But as you increase the level of filtration, the pressure drop that that fan has to overcome um, increases and increases. So at, at some point we are limited by the equipment in some cases, like the VRS, these indoor units. Um, but what we have done, in, as opposed to other installations, these units come stock with a filter that just goes in the back where you connect the return to, the return ducts work in a grill. So for two reasons, one for maintenance and one for better filtration, instead of utilizing that stock filter at the back of the unit, we've provided filter return grills and we've provided in most cases two of them to provide a very low velocity across these grills so we capture more particulate and increase the life of the filters as well as keep the noise down because we have a lower velocity. And now we put them in the actual face of the grills, the return grills themselves that are flush in the ceiling. So you don't have to get up into the ceiling and remove things to get at the filter and slide it out of the unit and change it. All you're doing is doing a quarter turn fastener on the face of the grill, which is hinged. It folds down. You have ease of access to the filter directly above you. Pull it out, put a new one in, and reattach uh, the grill um, cover. Um, so it's kind of addressed two items there. And these levels, um, and LT, these levels of filtration, that's why you're asking, this is what the state is asking us to do? Correct. Okay, so we are completely compliant with state COVID guidelines with Excellent. these filters. Because I know that's going to come up next week as well. Yep. So, thank you. How often do those need to be changed? It all depends on how, um, how many hours of usage, but the plan is, is like every 90 days to make sure we get in there once per season. Okay. Yeah, so this next slide is then just kind of a couple highlights. Um, for this particular system at East. Uh, so again, VRS capable of heating and cooling at the same time, that simultaneous heating and cooling. And again, that the thing that allows it to happen is the heat recovery boxes that we talked about. And one of the benefits is they can share energy between the different spaces. There are many different components in this system that utilize variable speed or variable capacity technology. Um, the cooling towers have variable speed fans. The compressor units for the VRS system are variable speed compressors. All of the ducted indoor uh, VRS units that are located in the classrooms and corridors uh, have ETM fans, which are variable speed. Um, all of these components that have this technology allow us to better match the load, and especially at part load conditions. We're not just running full out which allows us to have tighter temperature control as well as uh, take advantage of better energy savings. So we're not just wasting energy running full load when it, it may be a part load condition. And then we have the DOAS rooftop units, which again is a very high level of indoor air quality. It's kind of the Cadillac of ventilation. Um, and again, we've incorporated energy recovery to minimize the amount of mechanical heating and cooling that that unit is doing while we provide 100% fresh air to the building. And then at the bottom there, we have the summary of the main components and some listed uh, AHRI uh, efficiencies. Uh, so for the VRS and the DOAS rooftop units. Um, and these are kind of broken down, but AHRI, a, they are basically a testing agency. So these numbers, you know, EER stands for energy efficiency ratio. It's essentially a ratio of the BTUs or the amount of cooling that a piece of equipment can do uh, in comparison to how much power and watts you provide it. Um, IEER is basically just a part load measure. So you can see that's much more efficient. These, these different pieces of equipment are very efficient at part load conditions. Again, because of the technologies I talked about earlier, having variable speed and capacity reduction. 
Um, and then also uh, the ERV is also listed here for the DOAS uh, effectiveness. It's basically how effective it is at capturing heat in cooling and in heating. And again, you know, these, these numbers may not mean very much, um, and, and really they're, they're only useful for comparing, say, a BRF system versus another BRF system. Um, they're really not meant to be compared for, like, different pieces of equipment. Um, because these AHRI conditions, equipment. And to that point, Nathan, there's no direct correlation between these numbers and what you would see on, say, a residential uh, furnace. Uh, those are two completely different rating systems that don't don't cross back be, between each other. That, that's correct, Mike. And, and what they utilize at, at a residential level is you'll typically see here uh, a seasonal energy efficiency, efficiency ratio which they're, they're looking at the efficiency over the course of a full season of cooling that's typical for that area. And, and really it's meant to be um, independent of where you're located in the country, it's for the entire country. So again, that's really only effective for saying, uh, comparing a furnace and a condensing unit for a home versus you know one manufacturer to another, not for a chiller versus uh, a furnace. Okay. Then we'll move over to Proviso West now, and again we'll have a, a, a system diagram here to kind of help explain things. But in its essence, uh, the, the system for Proviso West is a four pipe vertical unit ventilator uh, system. Um, all of the, and, and there's various pieces of equipment. That's the predominant piece of equipment at the room level. We also have some fan coils, as well as air handlers in the, in the addition area in the corners of the, and, um, uh, the academic wing. Um, but the, the common thing is that each one of these pieces of equipment are considered four pipes, meaning they have a hot water supply in return and a chilled water supply in return being piped to them. So they have a hot water coil and they have a chilled water coil. And similar to the VRF, this allows them to do simultaneous heating and cooling, which gives you that flexibility again in the solar season when the weather is shifting from heating to cooling or vice versa. Um, at the top of the page, we have the components that are located at the central plant level. And then as they work their way towards the bottom of the page, the equipment serving the spaces. So starting in the upper left corner, we have the cooling side of things. So in this case, we have chillers that are actually doing um, our mechanical cooling and providing cold chilled water to each of these pieces of equipment. And the heat that comes back, the waste heat that's being rejected from the spaces to cool the spaces, is then rejected to cooling towers. So that's, our, that's our means of heat rejection. So very similar to the east in that, in, in that effect. Um, on, on the heating side of things, again, we have existing steam boilers, which the building already converts to hot water use, utilizing existing steam and hot water heat exchangers. And we, we did end up replacing a couple of the heat exchangers as part of uh, this project. One of them had been previously replaced, and we replaced the remaining two. Um, but again, this provides then hot water to the building for use. So we did some rework, but in, in a lot of ways, we, re, we reused the existing hot water system and then revised the distribution to serve this new equipment. Um, and so that's how we provide both heating and cooling to each of these units. So then as we work our way down to the pieces of equipment that are actually at the room level, on the left-hand side, we have the main piece of equipment, which is the vertical unit ventilator. Um, each one of these have, uh, at, you know, in, in contrast to east, these units are responsible for bringing in their fresh air. They're, they're, um, there's a louver that's located behind these vertical unit ventilators. The fresh air comes into the unit, is conditioned and mixed with the return air, and is delivered to the space. But again, the common theme is we're not sharing this air, this return air or fresh air with other spaces. It's, it's dedicated to the room that this unit is located in. 
Similarly, the fan coil units on the right hand side, these are these are cassette style units, they kind of fit in the ceiling. They're roughly two foot by two foot or three foot by three foot. They're located in the corridors, you'll notice on the third floor, and also um, smaller office spaces. They also have a ducted fresh air, which um, is is ducted from the roof. There's like an intake hood in the roof. And uh, that's ducted each one of these. And again, these are not recirculating air between spaces. It's, it's only mixing return air with fresh air from the room that it's serving. Um, one, one thing I wanted to, and maybe this, we can talk about this on the next slide, but um, uh, we'll get into the, 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 the specific technology of, of these chillers here. Um, but the, the highlights here are, again, we also have demand-based ventilation in this system. It's just implemented a different way. So we have CO2 sensors in each of the spaces. And instead of controlling the central rooftop unit that serves multiple rooms, you're controlling the outdoor air uh, at each one of these unit ventilators. But again, we're not under ventilating, we're not over ventilating, we're providing what the space needs and making sure we're not uh, wasting mechanical heating air cooling. Um, we touched on that we're not mixing the air from space to space. Each space has its own intake uh, or, or fresh air being provided in by that unit that's serving it. And then uh, the chillers themselves, I kind of wanted to highlight these. These are extremely efficient, the like latest technology in, in chillers. Um, it's referred to magnetic bearing, um, which is traditionally chillers have oil in their refrigerant, and that oil is used to lubricate all the moving parts of the compressor. Uh, what's unique about these chillers is there is no oil. They're considered oilless. And the reason being is they don't have, uh, you know, the shaft of a compressor resting on bearings and making that metal-to-metal -metal contact where you could have a hot spot and wear, and then you have maintenance issues or failures. Um, these, these components are actually levitated in a magnetic field, so you don't have that metal-to-metal -metal contact. Therefore, you don't need the oil, which, again, translates into less maintenance and longer lifespan of the equipment. So this is a, a, a neat technology that I kind of wanted to highlight. But again, it translates into very high efficiency in both full load and especially part load. Um, then kind of continue our theme of variable speed uh, capacity. We have variable speed pumps, which are responsible for circulating our condenser water between our chiller and our cooling towers. And then as well as our chilled water from the chillers to all of the, the various units that are located out in the rooms. Um, the cooling towers also have variable speed fans. And then uh, here at the bottom, we have the AHRI full load and part load uh, EERs listed for, for the chillers, so the chiller efficiency, which again are extremely efficient. Hey, Nathan, can you see yeah. my, I have some questions about the carbon dioxide monitors. Um, I'm just wondering kind of how those operate. I'm thinking of my, you know, we have carbon dioxide alarms in our houses. They're, you know, if it goes off, is, is there a problem or, or does the battery need to be changed is always our issue. How does this work here? Are they linked to a larger system? If it goes off, does someone somewhere else know? Is there a way to, um, you know, is the fire department alerted? Like how does that work in, in a school setting? So, so in your home, you, you'd actually have a, a carbon monoxide sensor. Uh, or, sorry, be, monoxide. Be, <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, I just, I, how does that work? Is it, you know, I'm thinking of like integrated home security systems where if your fire alarm goes off and you're not home, they call the fire department for you. Just how does, how does that work here in terms of safety and, and in the, a larger like building setting? Yeah, so, so carbon monoxide detectors, you're going to have located per code um, by fuel fired equipment. Um, so like at East, we have the rooftop units which, which have a gas fired heat exchanger. You're burning gas to make heat. Um, so we have a carbon monoxide detector, which is actually a, a relatively newer LAR in the, the state of Illinois um, that those now be provided in addition to smoke detectors and, and ductwork. Um, in the case here, we're not burning fuel. We're, we're providing hot water at the room level. So 
the sensors that we're referring to at West are the dioxide, so they're strictly looking at what are people expelling when they breathe to determine how much ventilation to be brought in. So something like that's not going to be sent to a fire department or anything. There's no emergency there. It's strictly being utilized as information from a control of that effect to determine how much ventilation to introduce. Now, certainly at East, where we have carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors located in this new equipment, all those types of devices are tied into the fire alarm system, which would, you know, in the event of a detection, would trigger that system, which would then, you know, notify the fire department. Okay. I'll say that generally speaking, the carbon monoxide detectors are a fire department by fire department thing on what they want to see as far as their notification is concerned. I'm not familiar exactly how your fire protection districts are looking for that information, so I don't know if LT, if you have any other information on that. As of right now, in the culinary labs at both East and West, we have units that's plugged into the receptacles. When they go off, the teacher press the emergency call button, it goes to security, then we call 911, then they come in. Obviously, we would go in there and test the equipment, but related to carbon dioxide, I believe that's human. That's what you're expelling. Okay, so I'm just, yeah, I'm just concerned because it seemed like with the two different systems, there were maybe two different sets of concerns. Yeah, they can do the motor ramp up when it notice high levels and do a ramp down. Is there a set point on it? So, for CO2, what it does in both cases, you're controlling the amount of air utilizing the damper. So, at East, there's a damper in the duct, the supply duct for each space. So, if ventilation levels are good, the damper will close. And when these dampers close, the rooftop unit will sense that change in pressure, and it will slow its fan down, saying, hey, I don't have to provide as much air. And by doing so, you not only save fan energy, but you also are reducing the amount of mechanical heating and or cooling you have to do. When you then need more ventilation, that damper would then open. The rooftop unit would notice that, hey, I got another change in pressure. I need to provide more fan, and it would work in reverse there. At West, you're really just controlling the damper at each one of these units. So, there's a damper on the fresh air and a return. And, you know, if you want to bring in more fresh air, that fresh air damper is going to crack open, and you're going to introduce more of that, you know, outdoor fresh air. If your ventilation levels are good and you don't need to provide more, that damper will then close to a minimum position and bring in a minimum level. So, you continue to ventilate, but you're not over-ventilating. Again, for the same reasons that we discussed at East, you're trying to save mechanical heating and cooling. And then my next question, thank you, this is really interesting, because these look like two, you know, really different systems, but kind of doing the same thing. Is the ventilation, or I'm sorry, the filtration, is it the same at West as it is at East? It's a little different. I believe it's a MERV 13 over at Proviso West. Nathan? I think it's still... I believe... It's 13 or 14. I will confirm that before the meeting next week. It's either 13 or 14. Okay, so it's still definitely within state compliance for this crazy situation. Got it. Thank you. Nathan, do you want to cover the comment? Oh, sure. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, so then this summary page is kind of some interesting information. So as part of these projects, we've been working with the local utility companies to apply for incentive money for doing these various projects and implementing, you know, various energy efficiency measures. And for this project, we actually did a custom... 
we actually did a custom path um, where ComEd uh, actually prepares an, their own energy model. So it's a, a third party, uh, you know, build energy model. Um, they utilize our information from the design documents to put together the proposed building and they run a comparison to the building, you know, the, the measures that we're implementing versus another benchmark building or a baseline, which is a code compliant building utilizing the layout of your existing buildings for east and west, but at today's current code standards. So they're, they're already an energy efficient standard. Um, and then they, they basically compare that benchmark building versus the measures that we're implementing. And, and these are the results of that, um, of, of their energy model. So, you know, they're, they're look, based on the measures that we're implementing at East and West, they've calculated that, you know, 443,300 kilograms less of CO2 emissions, um, just based on the amount of energy we're saving. Um, 669,000, so almost 670,000 kilowatt hours less electricity, um, you know, each year. And, you know, based on the, the, the utility rates that they were utilizing, uh, they're calculating a, a cost savings of, of almost $64,000 um, per, per year. And again, just the, the thing to keep this in mind, it's, this is um, the building as we've designed versus another benchmark building. Not the building that you that you had, that, you know, before the project was implemented. Um, you know, but those are, I think, uh, you know, very interesting figures, and um, you know, the comic came up with. And again, you know, another outcome of this is, you know, there, there's incentive money coming out of this for for doing this project. Thank you, Nathan. Um, any other questions or comments on the on the uh, HVAC energy efficiency? Okay. Um, we we're going a little bit out of order. I'll make sure that these get put back in a little order before our next meeting. Um, we did want to talk about a couple project alternates that we're able to incorporate because of the the funds that are available to the project. Um, so at East, uh, as you were aware, we're, we're looking at two biology labs at Space Scope. Um, we're putting an alternate in here to also do the same uh, renovation work to the uh, additional two biology labs across the street. Um, that across the, the hallway street, sorry. Um, the the intent here is if the funds are available at the time of bidding um, and they and the bids are are uh, coming well. Um, that this additional work could be done. Um, this isn't considered base scope again, this would be an alternate that can be accepted at bid day. Um, the same thing at West, uh, because we are doing some life safety work in the West kitchen, replacing some rooftop units, we talked about some efficiencies um, that could be brought, brought into the project to replace the uh, mechanical ventilation for the rest of the, the uh, the uh, lunchroom cafeteria sit seating area um, to hopefully as an alternate bring in air conditioning into that space. I'll hand it over to Carl to go through the uh, next topic, the West Concrete sun Sunshade Repair. Thanks Mike, I want to go to the next slide here. So like I said, I think we've uh, uh, touched on this topic uh, at a number of previous board meetings. Um, so just a quick refresher. Um, this is an HLS item related to the deterioration of the existing concrete sunshades at the academic wing over at Proviso West. Um, you can see that just these horizontal sunshades over the years uh, have uh, taken some abuse from the weather. And we now have various levels of, uh, uh, of deterioration where you see reinforcing exposed and some concrete cracking. Uh, and this was identified during the HLS survey, uh, uh, surveys needing addressing. So uh, in order to uh, look at some potential mock-ups that would give the district the most amount of flexibility to uh, kind of assess the aesthetic impact of the buildings, uh, uh, and the remedia, uh, remediation work to the sunshades. Uh, we developed four options uh, that the district and the board can consider here um, of various uh, uh, kind of advantages and disadvantages for each one. So I'll just kind of quickly run through them, uh, uh, starting at the left here with option number one, uh, 
um, which is where you know we essentially would take 20 linear feet of the most deteriorated sunshade, uh, restore it, and and make it uh, representative of the work that would be performed in sequence three. Uh, and this would you know, not only allow the district to uh, to really get a good sense as to how their building is going to look at the end of uh, the remediation process, but it would also allow us to do some additional discovery for existing conditions. Um, obviously, we have good uh, um, existing documents, but as we found at West, is that you know, the existing documents can be used but need to be verified, and this will allow that additional verification to take place. Uh, the, the downside of this option is that it is the most costly of the mock-up options at about $53,000. And, and again, this is work that, you know, a lot of the mock-up is work that would be performed in sequence three, so not only do you learn from this work, but it's also work that's going to be performed anyways when the repair to the sunshade is, is done. We're just taking a small bit of it and doing it earlier to allow us uh, to, infor to inform the rest of the process. Uh, uh, the most similar option that would save a little bit of money would be instead of taking the most deteriorated uh, portion of sunshade, uh, we would instead take the uh, most accessible portion of sunshade um, to be repaired. Typically, the most deteriorated sunshade is at the third story level. Uh, the most accessible sunshade would be at the second story level. Um, so this would be less costly, about $33,000. Um, the disadvantages to this is that it may not be the best representation of work to be performed during uh, sequence three, and we would probably recommend additional testing of uh, sunshades be performed uh, to just try to verify as many existing uh, conditions as possible. Again, this cost here would be uh, does not represent a, a whole addition to the sequence three work. It's simply a portion of the sequence three work that we perform a little bit earlier. Um, so that way it gives us some advantages in terms of uh, uh, discovering existing conditions as well as allowing the district to uh, review the end result of the uh, sunshade restoration. Uh, option three would be we forego any uh, in-site mock-up and simply do coring and testing. Um, you know, this is much less costly. We do not have a, a hard cost for this uh, at this point. Um, but it would be less costly than option two. Um, you know, again, the disadvantage, is, as you might suspect, that because it doesn't allow a simulation of the work, um, you know, there, there's an increased risk of unforeseen conditions for when sequence three work is actually performed. You know, we, we would try to discover as much as we can doing less invasive work, less costly work, um, but ultimately uh, it would not provide as, as good information as uh, options one or option two. Uh, the last option would be just to forego testing and mock-up, and obviously this is the least costly option. It would essentially be you know, zero dollars at this point. Um, but again, you can kind of see where we're going with this. Um, this one would carry the highest risk of unforeseen conditions possibly impacting work. So uh, you know, at this point, you know, we're looking for uh, direction from the district on, on which way they would like to uh, proceed. Um, we do have uh, proposals from uh, Bain, uh, and that work could be uh, completed uh, relatively uh, quickly, or I should say, in, you know, in the shorter term. Um, obviously, we are you know approaching the end of the season here, so um, you know this would be something that uh, probably need a decision in the next few weeks or so. And I could kind of defer to Gil Bain on that as to when that decision would need to be made by. So, any questions on the mock-up options for the West Concrete Sunshade Repair? Uh, no questions, but uh, just a recommendation from Proviso Township High School. Let's eliminate option three and four. Mm -hmm. And then we want a professional recommendation related to the best options for the district from Perkins and Wood. Okay, we can, if we're eliminating options three and four, we can uh, reconvene after this and, uh, and kind of uh, uh, you know, provide some recommendations and pros and cons of option uh, one and two in a little bit more detail. And just to give some background on this, the Perkins of Will and the group, everyone that's listening, mm -hmm. uh, this information has been shared with the administration team at the Math and Science Academy at district level. Uh, we do believe the best option is the $53,000 option. Mm -hmm. uh, obvious reasons, it's going to provide us an aesthetic on the spot, 20 linear feet. And this was the original option that Perkins and Will brought up. Um, we do want to shy on the side of following our professionals. So if that's going to be a recommendation, just send it over to us and we'd be willing to get it signed and get it moving on.
Along with that, can we also get maybe a timeline of when things could be started and completed? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like options three and four would require x-ray vision, so let's just get rid of those. <laughs> All right, thanks. I think uh, now we can go ahead and turn it over to Gil Bain. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Give me one second and I will share my screen. All right. Um, here is the construction update for Proviso Township High School. Proviso East Stadium. Uh, the painter is working on exterior and interior painting. Um, the face brick has been installed over at the concessions building. The visitor bleachers um, are in process as of this week, actually. Roofing insulation and membrane has been installed. The turf installation or insulation is in process along with uh, some miscellaneous sidewalks and curbs. Um, Michael mentioned that he was going to steal a little bit of my thunder when it came to the stadium as well. Here's some photos of the um, field being installed in addition to the press box. But I also would like to share with you all um, a video of the stadium and the installation. And so I'll let it play. That's amazing. Yeah, good job, Michelle. Well, that's a, that video is about two weeks old. It's a drone flyover that we did. We'll do another one um, in a week or two, and then one when the field is complete, just so that we can continue to show progress um, of the stadium and the field and the turf and all those good things. Link is available if anyone wants to just take a look at that YouTube link. It's available for uh, anyone to take a look at. Um, upcoming items for the stadium, the, tap, the track striping, the field circuit completion, again, sidewalks and curbs are in process, the athletic equipment, we've got um, the goal poster in, um, scoreboard is scheduled for the end of this month to go in, we're looking into the training and get some of the graphics ready for the first game, the parking lot at the stadium, and then one um, item that has come up is the gas line for the concession building. This item needed to be coordinated with NICOR, it's new gas service for the concession building. And reaching out to NICOR, they are requesting um, 20 weeks for procurement. So essentially six months in order for them to get new service over to the concession building. The gas line is needed obviously for um, us to get hot water over to the, the facility or heat over to the facility. Um, so we're doing a temp electric, we are proposing to put in a temp electric water heater, a 50 gallon water heater that will allow for um, the first game and any subsequent games for that matter 
um, hot water to be, to be provided at the sink for use while we continue to coordinate the installation of the new gas line with uh, NICOR. We started that process. We're waiting to hear back from their representative on next steps. And as soon as we hear back from them, we'll continue to update the, the construction team and this team. But in the interim, we want to make sure that we have hot water for the turnover in August. And this is our uh, temporary solution for that. Turnover in October? Pardon me? Turnover for October, correct? It is correct, yes. Turnover for October. Are we, are we currently into the 20-week procurement process at all? We are into the, we are currently into the 20-week procurement process. Um, we requested it, so please don't call me, but I believe it was the first week of August we started requesting from them. Um, they came back last week and said that it was a 20-week, roughly approximately, so they didn't, you know, give us hard dates yet, but approximately a 20-week procurement period for them. So we're waiting for them to give us firm dates, but that was their initial feedback to us. What's now? Here's a, here's a question that's coming next week, so I'm going to hit you with them now. How are we building around this, and what are we going to have to go back and possibly redo because of this delay? So we are working with the design team to um, come up with a location or perhaps an alternative location for our meter. Um, that would tie into the gas line that my car is going to bring out from the street. And so we're hoping to do minimal rework, if, if any at all. And Michelle, if I could, um, can, you, can you talk about the electrical gas water tank related to who's going to be paying for it? Um, so Gilbane will carry the cost or take care of the cost associated with putting in the temporary electric water heater and we're able to power that up you know with our electrician but our plumber is going to provide it and Gilbane will, will absorb that cost from our fee. So I, I have a question about the um, NICOR. 20 weeks for the procurement. You didn't even start to ask until August, even though we have this this um, project has been in existence for quite some time now. I 100% understand the concern. We've coordinated with NICOR for several other um, items. The 20 week, and we know that NICOR or our utility services, and I don't want to bash them, are are a little slow. The 20 weeks definitely isn't the norm and was not um, anticipated. Something like this typically takes about eight weeks to do, which would have given us enough time to get this completed. Um, unfortunately, and, and we will take this, the 20 weeks completely caught us off guard. We're still asking for more information as to why it takes 20 weeks and is there something that we can do to procure it faster, and we're waiting for a response from them. So I just have a question for you, LT. 20 weeks, that's a long time. Did you know sooner than what we're being explained to today that it was going to take 20 weeks for So the 20-week timeline was brought up, I want to say it was last Tuesday on the Perkins and Will Call. That was the first I've heard of it, but early on in the process, all of the utilities was discussed with the um, construction manager, and the construction manager was handling pretty much all of it uh, related to communicating with the village of Maywood for the water, ComEd for the electrical, and NICOR for the gas. I have been participating in those talks to introduce um, the construction manager to Maywood, ComEd, and NICOR. Uh, I did walk the paperwork through the process administration team here to make sure we got it signed. Um, but yeah, last week, Tuesday, was the first I heard of. Okay, but I want to, I guess I'm trying to find out when, you said early on it was discussed. When you say early on, what, what is early on? Related to the utilities, mm -hmm. early on was 
I would say a couple of weeks after the bids were awarded to the contractors to start to tear it down. So this is so some time ago. Yeah. It's been <coughs> but then, but then Gilvain did not um, ask until last week, even though this has been discussed months ago. I just don't see, we, we should not be in this predicament. Uh, so this water line, this temporary electric water, 50 gallon heater, is that, is that for, what, what area is that for? Um, the concessions building at the stadium. So the concession building, so let's say we have really, the, the people that are working in the concession stand, would have access to that water, is that what I'm understanding? Or is that for someone outside of the concession stand using that water? Michelle, that would be to support the concession stand, correct? Correct, to, con to support the sinks and things inside of the building, yes. So let's say we have a huge game. So, so the, the, are you saying that this hot water will not run out? Because we're really talking about a 50 gallon Tank rate. Yeah, I believe a 50 gallon tank is about the standard residential size. Right, right. Um, so if you have a continuous use of this water, are we saying that <clears throat> it will always remain hot or there's a point in time where the water may not be hot? Hey, Michelle, can we, oh. can we see if we can get a higher recovery tank that recover in like five to 10 minutes? If yep, this, I can start. If this wasn't already considered. You know, we, we met with our plumber and we asked our plumber for a recommendation for a building of this size to give enough hot water to the sinks for the duration of a game period, three to four hours. And this is what their recommendation was and what they came back with. I can reach back out to them to confirm that, you know, they do in fact feel that this is enough, uh, that it is properly sized for the activities that are that will take place at the concessions building again for sink use, um, and make sure I report that back. What's the school code on running warm water, hot water, warm water? There, there's a certain uh, for cooking. I believe it's 112, mm -hmm. 115 degrees in that range. Uh -huh. yeah. For washing hands. I'm not sure. I think I it's way it's in the 70s. 70, so like 76, but okay. So 20 weeks is a long time. So then, okay. Michelle, if we could add one other thing to your presentation for the next meeting. Um, mm -hmm. The flood work. Can we add in some a schedule related to the installation? I know uh, the construction manager had mentioned mid-September for delivery date for the equipment. Uh, we just want to make sure that we keep that on the radar. The way everybody understands when it's going to get installed. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments as it relates to the stadium? So you're possibly talking about January of uh, for this procurement with NICOR? And how that is correct. And, and, and NICOR do quite a bit of work in January? Uh, I'm talking about street. Um, running lines from the ground usually they're pretty snowy in January. Um, yeah, we're gonna run the which means they won't come out until uh, I guess it's safe to do so. So it could really be longer than 20 weeks. 20 weeks puts us in January. Well, that's, and that's if they get back to them today. We don't know, yeah. But will we be using the concession stands after? When's football season over? 
According to the published schedule, October 15th, which is that Friday, right. is the last home game. Okay, so we won't be using the protection statement to attempt that. No, but if we're in playoffs, it's a different story. Yeah, in the playoffs, that's a totally different story. Um, I don't believe after football season that we will be utilizing that space. Yeah, but I know early, late March, late March is track season, I believe. Is it one of the ADs on the call? I think late March, early April. Okay. I want to say late March is track season. And even after they agree to, pro to the procurement, actual date than the, the actual processing time for building is do we have an estimate on how much because we we just get to the point where we say okay and then after they say okay then what then we have to wait for them to execute the work um <laughs> so we, we, we've been waiting for time in for about three and a half weeks yeah so we're talking about january to get an answer and then well, either before yeah. or after and then after that with the weather conditions and everything else, a date for possible installation or even beginning of the work. So we don't really know with at all. Just out of curiosity, is there any reason when this was discussed early on um, about the utility, is there any reason that the call was not made? I, I'm just curious at that particular time. Why did we, because we pretty much have waited till the last minute to ask in August for something that they're saying is going to take them 20 weeks to. Um, mm -hmm. Typically something of this, you know, size should take eight weeks. We understand that when we're dealing with utilities, we're at their mercy, we're at their time frame. So, um, I definitely understand that with 20 weeks is something that none of us would have anticipated and it's, it's not the news that I want to deliver um, at this point. Um, I wish you would have known 20 weeks, you would have definitely looked at this a lot sooner. Six months is a long time for, for the gas service that we're looking for. So I will continue and the rest of my team to work with NICOR to improve that date and see you know, what their next steps and what their process is. Um, I understand the concerns with January, they're likely not the ones to come out. And if we have snow, they're not going to want to do snow removal in order to get to any underground, you know, piping and things like that. So if you guys will allow us to continue to coordinate with them and, and see if we can get a response from them this week and up until next week, then I can, you know, report back and give a further update as to where they are. If that 20 weeks is comprehensive, if they'll give any sort of guarantees um, on that, um, I, I can do that. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Okay. Um, right, so West, the AC is up and running on the third floor. The cooling tower installation and piping is completed. We are in the process of commissioning the units um, and final, finalizing the mechanical piping down in the boiler room over at Proviso West. Proviso East, keep in mind these boilers were taken um, about two weeks ago at this point, just before the freshman and sophomores occupied the space. The third floor corridor in the classroom has been completely cleaned out. All the crucible things in the classroom, stairways and quarters have been installed. The uh, drywall ceiling has been installed and were being painted late last week. Those should all be completed throughout. Uh, the start of, of the mechanical units is scheduled for September 9th. We were waiting for ComEd to start up their equipment. We know last week and the week before we had um, high temperatures in Chicago and um, they would not start up anything unless it was 80 degrees or cooler. So now we've reached those cooler temperatures. We're planning to start up the equipment on permanent power this Thursday, and hopefully we can proceed with that over at Proviso East. 
Can you update as to where we are with our allowances and change orders for um, the three projects? For Proviso East Stadium, here's a recap of our allowances. You've seen uh, this chart before, 378000 in allowances. We've spent 120000 or allocated 120000 We have 257000 remaining. So essentially, we have 68% of our allowances left um, for Proviso East Stadium. I've also broken it down so that we can see by trade where we are with each allowance, allowance where the magenta or the red is uh, money that's been allocated or spent, and the gray is balances that are remaining that we have not had to use um, the allowances that we placed in those contracts. Essentially, once we finish this particular sequence, if we do not use the allowances, we are able to credit them back and perhaps allocate them for additional um, projects or work. So this is just a recap again of Proviso East Stadium. These are uh, more trades for Proviso East Stadium. The gray are balances that we can essentially credit back. And the magenta is um, money that we've spent and are allocated already out of the allowances. And then one more slide visually for Proviso East Stadium. So you can see we've used the allowances for like landscaping and, and the running track, but we still have uh, money left for the field turf and some of our site utilities and things like that. Similar setup for Proviso East uh, mechanical upgrades. We have 520,000 in allowances. We spent 213. We have 306 remaining. So we have about 59% of those allowances remaining for the Proviso East mechanical upgrades. And we're about 90-95% done with the mechanical upgrades for sequence 2.2. Similar uh, that I just showed you for the stadium, here's where we are individually for each of those allowances. You can see visually um, the balances that we have left. Magenta, same setup, money that's been allocated or spent. The gray shows that money or the, in our balance that we can credit back at the end. This, again, is for Proviso East, additional trades, electric, and HVAC. Last but not least, Proviso West in our allowances recap, 257000 in allowances. We spent 166000 we've got 90000 left. We're about 95% done over at Proviso West with the sequence 2.2 work. We've got uh, essentially 35% of the allowances left, and hopefully we'll be able to credit back uh, in the upcoming months. Showing each trade individually, similar setup. You can see magenta is what we spent. Gray is the balances that we have left for each of those trades. One more slide for Proviso West to illustrate where we are. Michelle, great work. I want to thank you for putting all this together in the last couple of hours. Uh, but it looks like Proviso in the gray area is going to be receiving quite a bit of funding back to support Sequence 3 or any other work that the district would like to get done in the future. So thank you for breaking that down. Uh, we really appreciate your services. Yep, no problem at all. Um, the last item I have is that we were asked to provide uh, pricing for the furnishing and installation of a track and field surface system um, over at Proviso East across the street on First Avenue, so to the west of the school. Um, the cost, we did receive an estimate for that or a proposal for that, and I wanted to share that proposal. Um, 156970 was the proposal we received from one of our subcontractors to resurface the running track um, to the west of, the, of Proviso East High School. And then these are just some of the specifications for it. A blue track, a five-year warranty. We had it broken down for labor and material, um, the proposed system and the thickness of it. So is that the... The community field. Yeah, so this was a district request about four months ago. So I wanted Michelle to show this so that we can get, you know, some feedback on um, what kind of buy-in we want. Do we want to do this work? Do we want to omit this work? Um, in my opinion, 
over at Providers of East High School that walking track during the day is utilized for PE instruction. Um, I've heard uh, some of the teachers and some of the track coaches mention that when the pavement that's there now, when it get wet, it's really slippery. I do believe this work will bring a lot of value to Proviso East High School. It'll showcase the blue track on First Avenue when people pass by, and it directly supports teaching and learning when kids are actually out there utilizing that field. And we have already instructed and paid for um, those poles to be removed by Con Ed to utilize that grass area. So we want to bring this back up just to see uh, what kind of thoughts was around it and we can get a recommendation from Dr. Henderson and move forward with the work if that's what the district wants to do. Oh, yeah, because it's kind of slippery even if you're not right. Is that black? Did mm -hmm. you walk it? So, Michelle, the next steps for this work, I will bring this to Dr. Henderson, and Dr. Henderson will either give, our, give us the stamp of approval or um, shoot it down. Understood. Okay. And that completes um, my report for this afternoon. Thank you. We can have that by Tuesday. You think? Oh, yeah, for sure. A yay or nay. Yeah, I, just you want want to, I want to show a few updates. So here's a picture of the field um, a couple of days ago over at Proviso, High, Proviso East High School. It shows the blue end zone, it shows all the markings, and it shows uh, the 85 or 90 percent completion of the grandstand bleachers for the home, home side. Moving on to the next slide, uh, Michelle shared this slide here with the finished face break. Uh, that snapshot is looking really well, that work is moving along great. So great job, we really appreciate uh, Gil Bain for organizing and managing this work. Uh, here's a snapshot of near the boiler room. We had a new uh, sidewalk install around the walk, around the running track. Um, final cleaning, Gil Bain did a great job in assisting Proviso Township High Schools and getting extra help in Proviso East High School and Proviso West High School to make sure that classrooms were clean, corridors, bathrooms, hallways, exterior portions of the building. I really appreciate you guys, Michelle, for being right on point every time I emailed you, uh, causing you plenty of pain, I'm sure. Um, moving on to uh, the lights over at Proviso East High School, just wanted to showcase the lighting system that's going in for the football field. Over at Proviso West, we had one of our air handling units, a three-phase uh, breaker went bad. We had to replace the breaker on the right side there. You see the gaping hole where the breaker was. On the left side, that is where we replaced the breaker. The system is up and operational as we speak. There's no further work needed at this time. Uh, that is the end of the updates. Anybody have any questions? All right, thank you so much, everyone. This was a really informative meeting. We got a lot of great information, especially about the new um, air conditioning systems at East and West. I appreciate that. Our next uh, facilities committee meeting is going to be on October 5th uh, at 3.45 p.m. in here. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Is that five, ten five? Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.